introductory materials for the introductory to the course. So welcome to a hsp 2 n course, uh, task-based policy in scientific computing. Uh, my name is Mirko Milkos. I'm a senior research engineer at UME University, and I also work as application expert at the hsp 2 n Computing Center. Uh, you're probably already aware what is the up, what is the overall up, overall topic of the course. So you already read the abstract. So this course is supposed to be about uh, task-based policy, and I'm mainly going to be concentrating on uh, OpenMP. OpenMP has uh, since OpenMP 4.0 and it was updated 4.5. There has been support for tasking, so I will mainly discuss in OpenMP but I will also discuss uh, stop you through the third day. The course is entirely organized over two and it is three days. So today, tomorrow and Wednesday, and we will start around nine and then we'll finish around noon, depending on how, how many people are still present around noon. Uh, besides myself, we have the two helpers on the course. We have Pikita and we have a Petro here. Hello. I'm going to be helping you. Yeah, so the idea ideas that I will be giving a set of lectures, and some of these lectures also include hands-ons. And after each lecture, there is going to be time to do the hands-ons, and we will probably divide people into separate breakout rooms, the three rooms, and each room will have one, one of us helping you. And then we will see that uh, if there is need for such a breakout rooms during the later during the course. But at least for the first set of hands zones, we will be dividing people to uh, breakout rooms. Uh, when it comes to the prerequisites for the course, of course, I'm assuming that you know something about the C language, C programming language. I also assume that you know something about parallel programming. And you have the basic Linux skills, mainly because you, you can, of course, use your own laptop or computer to do all the hands ons but you can also have access to the Kepnekai supercomputer. And this computer runs Linux. And uh, that's why you should have a, at least the basic skills how to operate a Linux computer. And then I said here that the basic knowledge of OpenMP would be highly beneficial, but not absolutely necessary. When it comes to SEDU, uh, since this is the first time we are organizing this course, we don't know how long we should give people time. So therefore we do not have a strict schedule for the course. Instead, I have just divided the, um, the content to three, for three days. And then we will see how it goes. It's possible that one of these three days ends up being longer than the other three or shorter. So it's all based on your feedback. So during the course, if you feel that uh, things are moving a bit too fast or too slow, please let us know in the, in the chat or using this uh, features that I want you to indicate that you would, would like me to uh, slow down or, uh, or move, move to the next topic. So the first day we have two lectures that are specific for, uh, for his business and Kepnekaise. So the first lecture is given by Pikite and that is a general lecture we give at the beginning of each course and it mainly tells you what his business do and is. After this, I will give a lecture how to use the Kepnekaise supercomputer in the corners of this course. And then comes the uh, first actual lecture of the day, introduction to task-based parallelism. And then since I was looking at the registration information where you always ask, do you know OpenMP? It turns out that around 50% are not that familiar with the OpenMP. So that's why I have included two short lectures with hands-ons about the, that deal with the basics of OpenMP before it comes to any task based stuff. So here probably if you are already very uh, fluent with OpenMP, then these two lectures that are later this morning are not absolutely necessary for you. All the task related stuff actually starts or, or practical stuff related to us starts tomorrow where I have two lectures on OpenMP tasking. And then I have one uh, larger hands-on for you that where you will uh, basically apply task-based processing to a real numerical algorithm. For the third day, I will be giving a lecture or repeat of a lecture, a presentation I gave a year and a half ago about my own work with task-based processing. And after that, I have two lectures that deal with the uh, stop you runtime system and tell how that could be used. And then there is one additional, a larger hands-on for you to do after that. 
And you also should have received an email just before the course where you received the links to, uh, to, uh, to uh, two documents. So the first document is so-called master document and I have here created a short URL for it. And we will keep continuously updating this document if there is some information that people have to know. So if you want to know what is the latest status with the course, then you should go and check the master's document. It includes links to all other documents and of course materials. So I highly recommend that you bookmark this document. Then there is also a Q&A page that, where you can ask questions. And I would highly encourage you to use this document instead of a Zoom chat. Because what happens with Zoom chat is that once the session ends, the chat gets erased. And uh, if a person joins the Zoom session later, they don't see any of the messages in the chat that came before that. So that's why we would like that people would use the Q&A page to ask questions, because then we can record those questions and answers and they are also available for everyone else, even after, after the course. And, and uh, last remaining thing is that for these lectures, we will be recording them and we will be uh, uploading them to his and YouTube channel so they are publicly available. And, uh, and during, if you don't want your uh, face to appear in these recordings or your name, then I recommend that you disable, make sure that you disable your camera and microphone during the lectures. When it comes to hands-on sessions where uh, that comes after the lectures, those are not recorded. So uh, for those, if you have questions or you want to share your desktop to show if you have some issue, you, then you can be just assured that that is not going to be recorded, uploaded anywhere. It is only the uh, lectures themselves that are going to be recorded. And at this point, do people have any uh, questions they would like to ask about the practical stuff relating to the course? Okay, I'm not hearing anything or seeing anything in the uh, Zoom chat or the Q&A document. So then I would like to give the stage for Pikite, who will be giving a short lecture on uh, HPC 2 n Hi, uh, my name is Pikite Bolsu, and I will be giving uh, the lecture on HPC 2 n So I will share my screen. Okay, so I don't know how many of you actually have used HPC 2N systems, but um, HPC 2N is short for High Performance Computing Center North, and it's a national center for scientific and parallel computing. And it's part of the Swedish National in Infrastructure for Computing, which is called SNIC. And uh, HPC 2N is funded by a Swedish Research Council that is VR or Wetenskapsrådet, uh, as well as uh, its partner universities, which are Luleå University of Technology, Mid Sweden University, Swedish Institute of Space Physics, uh, the uh, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, as well as Umeå University. And HPC 2N provides both computing resources uh, in the form of uh, mainly our cluster Kebnerkaise, which uh, Mirko will talk about more later. And we also give user support, different types. We give primary, advanced and dedicated user support. And the primary is mainly done by uh, the support team, whereas the advanced and dedicated support is mainly done by the application experts, which I will mention more about later. We also give user training like this course and various other forms of education. We also give directed courses sometimes if a research group has an, a special need of an introduction to some area. And then I will talk briefly about the HPC 2 n management and personnel. We have our director, which is Paolo Bintinesi. And then the deputy director, which is Björn Torkelsson, and Lena Hellman, which is uh, administrator. And she will be sometimes the one you talk to if you send something to the info list. But usually, if you are contacting HPC 2N, you should send to the support list if it's anything about the systems themselves. And then it will, in the first 
round go to the sysops and then you can also ask for specifically that you want something handled by application experts and also sometimes which one you want to handle the case since they have different uh, areas they are focused on we have some application experts we have Yari Eriksson we have Mirko Murikoski which is uh, the main person giving this course and then we have Pedro Orsheda May which is also here today uh, to help with this course and then also the the system and support people and among those is uh, me Birgitte which is also part-time application expert and so is Orke Sandgren and so is Lars Wiklund. There are also several other people that are associated with HPC Twin and you can go to HPC Twin's website and look there for people. So I will say something briefly about HPC Twin's systems. And we currently have one supercomputer, which is called Kepner Kaiser. And it is named for a mountain or a massive where some of Sweden's largest mountain peaks are. We got it from uh, Lenovo and it started uh, to be in use in November, 2016. And later in 2018, we got more nodes. We got Skylake nodes and we got NVIDIA V100 GPU nodes. So we have Broadwell nodes, 432 of them. And those were the ones that were in the original system. And then we got this extension, which was Skylake nodes, 52 of them. The large memory node has been there also since the beginning, as well as the KNL nodes. And KNL is uh, a somewhat different type of architecture, which uh, you can see here has 68 cores, and it also has two different types of memory. And because of this, it is uh, somewhat more involved to write software for it, and they have not been used so much. And Intel has also decided to discontinue this line of uh, architecture, though I believe they will incorporate some of it into other later types of chips. Uh, apart from the CPU nodes, Kipner Kaiser also has GPU nodes. And we have uh, 32 K80 GPU nodes, where there are two GPUs on each. And then we have four that has four K80s. In addition to that, we have newer GPU nodes, V100s, with two on each, and there are 10 nodes of those, and they are on um, Skylake nodes, where the others are on Broadwell nodes. So in total, Kepler Kaiser has 602 nodes in uh, 15 racks, and that it gives uh, 19,288 cores. And we have also more than 136 terabytes of memory. So there's a lot of memory on the Kepner Kaiser system. And this altogether gives 984 teraflops if you count it uh, theoretically. And if you run Linpack to test it, it got 791 teraflops and that is 80% of the peak performance. We also have storage. And this, what I mentioned here is uh, for accessible for the users. If for default, you will have 25 gigabytes in your home directory. And since that is not very much, you usually will also need project storage. And there is a default amount that you can ask for. And otherwise, you will have to apply for a storage project. And that storage project will, in any case, be shared between all members of uh, the project. And these uh, projects, they are applied for through super. And that is actually why you needed super accounts as well, because all the projects are controlled through that. So the compute project we have for the course is uh, going through super, whereas uh, the accounts themselves will be uh, on HPC 2N. So there are three types of compute projects. There are small, which is up to 5,000 core hours per month, and anyone who is at least a PhD student can apply for it. And they are evaluated weekly. Then there are medium sized projects. And those goes from those 5,000 and up to 200,000 core hours per month. And you have to be at least an assistant professor to apply. 
and those are evaluated each month, usually at the end of the month. And we do recommend that people have a small project first to see if their code actually runs well on the systems. And then there are also large projects, and those are the ones for more than 200,000 core hours per month. And to get those, you have to have had a medium project before. And you also have to prove that you used to, that you actually need more resources than this, and you have to be a, a senior researcher in Swedish academia to be a PI for this. And those are only uh, call the only calls for the large projects two times a year, and that uh, so those are quite large projects, usually for quite large groups, also research groups. One thing to note is that you can be a member of a project, even if you are not in Swedish academia. It's only for the PI. So if the PI wants you in the project, then it doesn't matter if you're in Sweden and you also don't need to be in academia. So you can be added in any case. And as I said before, the only available storage is the 25 gigabyte in your home directory. And that will not be enough for most types of uh, project that you are and jobs you are running. And uh, when the, you apply for a compute project, then you can also apply for the default storage, which is 500 gigabyte. And if you think that's enough, then that is very easy and you just click that. If that is not enough, then you can apply for storage projects instead. There's a small one, which usually goes with the small pro uh, compute projects that goes up to three terabytes. Again, you have to be a PhD student and they are evaluated weekly, so that is quite fast. The medium ones are three to 30 terabytes, assistant professor to apply monthly. And the large ones are when it's more than 30 terabytes. And again, that is only twice a year. And as I said before, this project storage will be shared uh, between all the members of the project. So you have to calculate how much you need. And uh, if the others are using a lot, then those are the ones to talk to if there's not enough space in it uh, for the jobs you are running. So you have to look at it together. And you also usually create your own directory under this uh, storage project. And we are going to try and do that actually as part of this course, if you are running it on HPC 2N systems. As Mirko said, you can also run it on your own system as long as you just have access to, uh, to the compilers and things. And you can go to HPC 2N again to the websites to see if, more information about projects. And when you have the project, then you can apply for an account at HPC 2N. And there is one thing to note, and that is you need to sign the SNCC user agreement because if you don't, then we don't actually get the account uh, request. So they will not send it to us before people have signed that. Then I will say a little bit about how to connect to the HPC 2N systems. And to use them, you will need to log in. You will need to use either an SS, some sort of, you need some sort of SSH client and you may need an X11 server if you want to open graphical displays. And if you have not before used uh, an SSH client, and if you don't have anything set up that you like to use, then we recommend that you use ThinLink because this is very easy. You just uh, download the ThinLink client and then uh, install it and then it will just be ready to go. You just connect to um, HPC 2N's ThinLink login node. And there are more guides that you can go and look at. There is one here for the ThinLink and that is the same for all the operating systems. And then we also have guides for how to use it. Other SSH clients on Linux, Windows or Mac. When you first get your account at HPC 2N, you will get a temporary password. And that one you can find, for, you can uh, find by clicking this link here. And it will also have been in the email you got uh, when you uh, were welcome to HPC 2N and when you got your account. And you will authenticate with your super credentials. And after you have done that, you will get uh, 
a new password that you can use on HPC 2N and you should uh, change it to something that's easier to remember because this will be a long string that is probably not going to be very easy to use. So logging in, if you're logging in from uh, the terminal with something like Linux or Mac OS, then you would just say SSH, your HPC to end username and note it should just be the username, not the domain and things also. And it should also not be the super username unless it's the same as your HPC to end one. So remember HPC to end and super have separate accounts. That at kebnekaise.hpc2n.umu.se. And if you have X11 set up, which you would automatically on Linux and on Mac, you would uh, download a program to do that. And it's described on the above guides. Then you would just add minus Y. If you're using ThinLink, then the ThinLink client, you would just start it up and you would put in kebnekaise minus tl.hpc2n.umu.se, your username, and then you should type your password here instead of uh, waiting for it to ask for it. Because for some reason, it will fail every time if you, are if you don't put it directly here on this uh, login. And one thing also to do is the first time you should go to options security and check that it's set to password so it doesn't try to authenticate some other way. You should go to options screen and uncheck the full screen mode because especially if you have a smaller screen like a laptop, it will uh, otherwise fill more than the screen because it fails to see the resolution correctly. And then you can connect and it will ask uh, if you want to put the server's host key into your registry and you just say yes to that by continue. It will take a little while and then it will connect. And then you will have a whole uh, web page where you can, sorry, a whole screen where you can see the desktop and where you can work on it by clicking with the mouse and things. So, uh, and open any sort of GUI. You can also open terminal windows inside of that. So it is quite a lot easier that way. And I have a small challenge for you that you can try here after this here. And that is that you should try to log in to HPC 2N using either ThinLink or your SSH, SSH client of choice. So we will give you a short time after I have finished talking here to try and do that if uh, you are using the HPC 2N systems. And you may want to transfer files, but this is not going to be really relevant for this course right now because uh, you can clone all the, you will probably, you will be creating the files directly on the system or on your own system. So I will go to editors instead, which will be relevant because you will need to copy some example files out from these um, presentations that we have here. And then you will use those to either test run or to make small changes to. And to do that, you will need to use some sort of editor. And if you have not used a Linux system before, you will find that the editors are different. There is uh, not, nothing like notebook, but there are things like Vim or Nano or Emacs and a lot of other ones. And if you have not used any of them, I will suggest that you use Nano because that is probably the easiest to use of those. To start that, you just say Nano and the file name, and you can also use it to create a file. So it either has to be a name that exists or the name of the new file that you're just creating. And when you exit it, you do it with control X and then it will ask if you want to save or if you just want to exit. They're also possible to use Emacs, but that is a bit more involved. And then there is another exercise that you can try. And that is that you should also, when you have logged into the system, you should try and open and edit a file using Nano.
And I don't think I'm going to talk very much about the file systems at HPC 2N other than saying that uh, when you do log into it immediately, you will go to your home directory. And you while you can run batch jobs there, it is not the recommended place to do so. You should do that in the project storage. And you should try and do that for this course as well, since we do have project storage. And the link to or the path to it is this one. So you would simply go to uh, slash project slash no backup slash sneak to 2021 minus 22 minus 272. And that is also as a small exercise for you. Try go to that and then create a new uh, subdirectory under it so that you can put your own files there and then go into that. And then that is where I, we suggest that you uh, try and run these examples from. And one thing to know is that the only place that is backed up is also the home directory. So if you do have important files you want to keep, like configuration files for programs and things like that, you should put those in your home directory. Anything that cannot easily be recreated should go there. And then I just have one more thing to say, and that is I will talk a little bit about the batch system, which is where you will run some of the um, examples in. Uh, HPC Terrain used to something called SLAM. SLAM is simple Linux utility for resource management, and that is a batch system. And it's an open source job scheduler, and it keeps track of uh, the system resources. It also enforces uh, the uh, policies that we have put, and it also manages a job queue where your jobs go into and sits and wait until they are scheduled. And the batch system is what you should use for anything but the smallest examples. So for this um, course here, there will be some very small uh, things to run and those you will run on the login node because uh, it will take too long to wait to run them on the, on the batch system. And it also doesn't matter as long as it's a, like a short thing that takes sec takes second to run. But if it's something longer, or if it uses a lot of resources, then it should go through the batch system. Because otherwise, the login node will be severely slowed down by many people running large jobs. And then no one can really do anything, and we may kill the jobs for you and tell you to run them on the batch system instead. And I believe that Mirko will have some examples on how to use the batch system on the, the next uh, lecture, which is uh, how to use the system. There is some uh, documentation on HPC Twins website here yeah, on the support on, with various examples for how to use the batch system and also some more things about the policies and how the job, job scheduler runs. So. Uh, I would, let's see, it's 9.30. I think that maybe we should try and give people five, 10 minutes to see if they can log into the Kipnikaiser system and if they can try open one of the editors and also go to the project storage here, this path, and create a, a directory for themselves there. Yeah, so um, I, I think it's five to 10 minutes and I highly recommend that you go and try to log in because we frequently have people who either had had accounts earlier and they think they, they are still active or something went wrong in the account creation process if it's a new, a new user. And, and it, can sometimes, it can sometimes be fixed in a few minutes but sometimes it can take a few hours to be fixed. So I highly recommend that everyone goes and uh, tries to log in and see that works. And Brigitte is the person who can most easily fix any issues relating to the uh, access to the cluster. Yeah, so test it out and uh, tell us if there's any problems. So, Actually now 9.40, so I will start right away. So this lecture is supposed to be about the Kepnekaise cluster itself and how to use it in the context of this course. 
So the learning goes out to learn how to load the necessary models to compile the example codes and the hands-ons on a Kepnekaise, how to use the C compiler and how to use the CUDA compiler. And then also how to use the patch system that Brigitte just mentioned in the end of her lecture. And as I already mentioned, most of these uh, hands-ons that I that are in the uh, end of the end of tomorrow and end of Wednesday, for those you should then use this uh, patch system to actually submit the jobs to uh, to, uh, to queue, since those are going to take a bit longer to run, and you also need more CPU cores to, to run them. And then uh, what was already mentioned in the chat is that I will also talk about the course project and the course reservations that you can use to get the high pri high priority access to the cluster during this course. So I would like to start about talk a little bit about model system and the different tool chains that you have to use to compile a source code on a Kepner Kaiser. So in order to compile code, you have to load uh, the correct tool chain. And this tool chain includes such a things as a compilers, for example, and, and lab libraries that are compatible with, with, that, with that compiler. And everything is organized in the models on a Kepner Kaiser. And if you want to see what models are available, then you can use a command called ML, a model avail, models available. And when you run this command, it will print you this long list. It's much longer than we displayed here. And it tells you all the models that are directly available for your use. So you can see what is the name of the model. So in this case, it's a Python model called Python or a model called uh, FOSCUDA. And after the name of the model, you can see what is the current version of the model. So the one of the basic ideas behind the model system is that you can load a uh, different kind of software very easily, and you can also load the different versions of the same software very easily. And the model system makes sure that the environment in which you are running your software after loading the model is set up in a correct way. Uh, this doesn't necessarily display you all the models at the moment. If you already have some models loaded, then what this MLIL is going to display to you might be slightly different. So it's all a bit uh, con con context specific because some models can be loaded only if you have already loaded some other models before that. If you want to get some information about the model, you can use a command called model spider and then the model name. So for example, you can request information about the model called the MATLAB. And this will then display to you what versions of MATLAB are available. And it will tell you what the model is and what it does. And there is all sort of other information available for you. And once you have found a model that you like, you can then use ML and the name and a version of the model. And this will then go and load the model and set up environment correctly so you can use whatever this model is providing to you. If you want to discover models you have already loaded, you can just write ML, and this will simply display to you all the models that are currently loaded. So here earlier, I have loaded the model called MATLAB, so we can see that that is loaded. And in addition to MATLAB, you can see that there is a whole bunch of other models that are actually loaded if automatically when you are loading this uh, MATLAB model here. I'm using MATLAB here as an example to in this course, you are not meant to use MATLAB. Uh, the only reason I'm using here is that the MATLAB is a good example of the model that is going to load a lot of other models with it. So you can see that it has a loaded a tool chain called Intel, which includes Intel compilers and all sort of uh, various libraries that, that, that come with it. If you want to go and load, unload all the models, which is uh, sometimes very handy. So you can use a command called ML purge, and this will unload all the models and set the environment back the way it was before you loaded any models. There is just one warning, which is that it will always tell you that it, it did not unload all the models. There are two models that are so-called sticky, and these are always loaded. It is telling you that you could use this force command to force unload them but you should never do that. These models should always be loaded and they are protected so that if you use the model purge command without the force argument, they are left there. 
So please don't uh, use this force option with the model purge command. Then I have a little bit of challenge here you. So after I finish the lecture, you should go and quickly scan through the materials again and try to do these uh, quick challenge challenges on a Kepler Kaise. And so you get familiar how the model system works and how you load a specific, specific uh, model so you can compile your source code. And tomorrow when you start, start the next set of lectures and next set of hands-ons, you can go back to these materials and see how do you actually load the models again. Every time you log out from the system and come back to log in again, you have to load the correct models again. They are always session specific. Then for C code, I'm assuming that we are using GNU compiler. So if you have a source code, you can use this uh, GNU compiler. So you just give it the list of source files and then the binary name here. And I highly recommend that you use this command called wo that is going to print additional warnings relating to your uh, source code. So this is a very handy, especially it can detect all sort of minor things that are not errors by themselves, but it might indicate that you have some sort of underlying uh, issue with your source code. And again, I have a challenge where you're supposed to compile a Hello World program and see that you can load the correct uh, tool chain. And then uh, there is probably going to be for the third day, some CUDA materials that are not yet, I haven't pushed them yet to the materials, but I will do it then later today or tomorrow that are compiled with the NVCC compiler that behaves very similarly to the GNU compiler. And I have a hello world example for you to compile again. And you should go and see that you can actually compile it and make everything work correctly. Then the course project. So in order for you, uh, you us to run anything on a Kepner Kaiser, you need to be a member of the project. And for this course, we have made a course project called SNIC 2011-22272, which is valid until uh, 1st of June. So in order to even get access to the access to cluster these days, you must be a member of at least one project. Then during this course, or between 9, 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., we also have additional thing called course reservation that is going to give you a high priority access to the cluster. So if you don't use the reservation, then you will be given the priority that is specific for the course project. And that priority is usually not that high, but if you have a reservation, it means that we have actually set aside a few compute nodes just for this course, but they are available only during 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. If you try to use the reservation outside this time window, then the job doesn't get scheduled. So you should only use them during this time window. Outside this time window, the nodes are moved back so everyone else can use them. And there is different reservation for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and depending on if you want to use CPU only or a CPU and a GPU. So you have to go and get the correct reservation ID from this table to make sure that you get the access. And please remember to check the correct date because this Monday reservation is no longer valid on Tuesday. And then when it comes to certain jobs, so these are uh, bigger computations where you need a lot of CPU cores and more time. And here you have to use a, either a command called asrun that is going to place the command into a job queue from which one of the compute nodes will then later on schedule it. And the arguments you have to provide to it is the account number. So in that case, it is the project ID. So here you have to tell how many of these uh, jobs you want to run and how long you would like it to run. An example you can see here that we have specified the course project. We are telling that we want to run the job only once and we are requesting 15 seconds. And the command we are running is called uptime. And when you run it, you will see that it gets added to the queue and it is waiting for resources. And then at some point it will actually start running. And then you can see that this particular login node has been running for five days in this case. I know that we are, I'm requesting only 15 seconds. So, and that should be enough for all the small hands-ons. Hands -ons, but as I said, you should maybe run those on the, uh, on the login node instead. For the uh, actual bigger hands-ons uh, that are tomorrow noon and uh, Wednesday noon, those usually 
five minutes would be sufficient amount of time to run those. They usually should run in a few minutes. Then, if you want to use the reservation, you must use your additional argument called reservation, and then you must give it the correct reservation ID. And this uh, then places it to this uh, one of these reserved nodes. You can go and run multiple jobs. So in this instance, we say that the end task is four, and what and we are running a command that is going to rate print the uh, host name of the node, and you can see that all of them end up running on the same node, but they are just running hopefully on a different CPUs on the same node. If you want to allocate multiple uh, CPU cores for the same task, then you can use CPU per CPUs per task argument. In this instance, I'm telling that we are running four tasks and for each task, we are allocating 14 cores. And this time you can see that the first two tasks are running on the node 0935 and two remaining ones are running on node 0932. So they are actually now going to a different nodes because we are requesting multiple CPUs for each task. If you want to know, if you want to access to the entire node, then you can use the keyword exclusive that basically gives you an entire node and it prevents anyone else from running jobs on that particular node. And this is mainly useful in situations where you either need all the memory in the node or you want to do some sort of timing related runs to make sure that no one else is uh, affecting the time measurements by running stuff simultaneously on the same node. And finally, if you want to get access to NVIDIA V100 GPU, you must add this argument here, specifying that you would like to have a one V100 GPU with exclusive access to it. And you, you just add it here so you can see that we have the reservation. This time we are using the GPU reservation for the first day. And we are asking for one V100 GPU. And then we are just using the NVIDIA SMI command to print information about that particular GPU we got access to. And there is again okay, a challenge. You should go and uh, run the Hello World program on both types of compute nodes to see that you can use the app up correctly. Then you may have noticed that these commands that we are running are quite long and it might be uh, difficult to go and type them separately every time. If you want to have a shortcut for a command, you can create an alias where you use the command alias and then you give the alias name. And then you say the command for which you are creating an alias. So for example, we could do an alias called run full, which is an alias for a command as run with this account number with the first day CPU reservation for one task with the 28 cores for five minutes. And after creating it, you can just write run fall instead of writing this whole entire command here. And the last thing to consider are the patch ops. So instead of uh, running the as run, you can instead write all the related commands to one file. So in this case, the file called patch.sh. And at the beginning, you will be outputting all the arguments that were earlier given to the as run command. So you start with a has as patch, and then you put the account number, you can put the reservation number, number of tasks, and so on and so on. And after this, you have all the commands you want to run in this patch shops. So usually what people do is that you purge all the modules to make sure that the environment is clean, and then you cloud the modules that you want, and then you have the commands you want to uh, execute. And once you, you can use then use the as patch command and then give the name of this file that you have created earlier to submit this patch job and then it's going to indicate that it has successfully scheduled this uh, patch job. By default, all the uh, output goes to a file called slurm job ID and this job ID is given here when you run the as patch command. And then you can investigate what is the actual uh, output, for example, using a cat command. And you can see all the output that came from the commands included in the patch file. And again, I have a challenge where you should go and uh, uh, write the patch file where you try to run it on a CPU node and a GPU node. Last thing to cover is the job queue itself. So if you have submitted jobs to the queue, you can use as queue command and then your username to see if your job's in the queue. And, and if it's there, then you can also give your additional argument called 
line line start. That is going to give you an estimate when your job actually starts running. And if you're unhappy with the job or it takes too long, then you can just use as sample and the job ID to sample the job you have submitted. So that concludes this uh, quick uh, lecture about Gepnekais and use the patch systems. And I would now like to give people some time to go and try it out that they can actually use the use the patch system correctly. And then in a Zoom, it has this a feature where you can uh, give reactions that show up in the participant list. So once you have, uh, once you think that you are, you have done, you either have are already familiar with the patch system or you have done the challenges, then please indicate as a, as a there that you that you have uh, that you have done the, the hands-ons. So I can move to the next lecture.